Hey folks, this is a quick disclaimer that while I was working on this, a friend told me about a GoFundMe she's using to help get funds for her mother's cremation. She's going through a lot of hard times right now and she could really use the help. She also requested that I don't show the mother's face to respect her privacy, so I cropped it out. The link to the GoFundMe will be in the description, so if you have time, please donate to it. It's for a good cause, and my friend would certainly appreciate it. I also wanted to give a special shout-out to Looney Turtle, who provided me the footage for this movie since I don't have Netflix, as well as Leo Convoy for making the thumbnail for this video. Sorry if this took a while, but it's finally here. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Is mayonnaise an instrument? Ooh, you said a bad word. Huh? Hurry, before we get jinxed. Oh. Ping pong, ping, ping pong, ping pong, ping pong, ping pong. Well, it's been a pretty long time since I covered this series, hasn't it? Though considering the title, it might not be such a welcome return. For those who don't know, I'm a fan of the hit series My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. I know it sounds really sappy, but I was one of the people who got caught up in the hype surrounding this show. Developed by Lauren Faust, who's famous for various other cartoons she worked on over the years, this incarnation of MLP was meant to be something more than just an ad for a little girl's toy line. It was an actual show, with developed characters, a continuing story over the course of nine seasons, a world with an established lore, but still remaining an entertaining show with sharp comedic writing, productive life lessons for kids, and a light-hearted tone that remained consistent throughout the series. It was a traditional Saturday morning cartoon, something we needed more of in a time when cartoon television was at an all-time low. There was something about it that made it a highly enjoyable experience. The hype for each new episode, the creativity surrounding the fandom, it was practically a phenomenon. And when it was all over, we were left with all sorts of great memories of the time we had with it, the friends we made through our love for the show, and how it sparked the creativity of so many people. It was actually this very show that got me into being a reviewer on YouTube, because I wanted to talk about what made it so great, and why it mattered so much to so many people. For better or worse, this show played a very important part of my life, and it's become one of my all-time favorites. While it's obviously not as good as The Last Airbender or Samurai Jack, it still has a sense of uniqueness and wonder with an incredible cast of unforgettable characters that makes it, what I consider, a masterpiece of TV animation, as well as Lauren Faust's best work. So as you can imagine, Hasbro wanted to use the series' newfound popularity to increase their reach. In spite of G4 ending, G5 was stated to be a direct sequel to the events of G4. So now, instead of G5 being its own thing, like it should have been, it's gonna be used to try and milk G4's popularity even more. Why is this a problem? Well, because this wasn't the original idea. A few years earlier, there was actually other ideas for G5 that Hasbro released. Or was leaked illegally. It was going to be a full-on reboot that would include characters fans would be familiar with, but still take place in a different universe from G4. In spite of what some dipshits on DeviantArt would have you believe, this was actually an interesting direction they could have gone. A completely new series with a new setting and bizarre yet unique concepts while remaining faithful to the tone of the franchise. But for reasons I can't understand, Hasbro scrapped this concept completely in favor of just making G5 a sequel to G4. Same world, same lore, and no uniqueness by simply reusing old assets. G4 of My Little Pony wasn't good because it was trying to be a continuation of a previous generation. It was good because it was trying to be its own thing. It was a standalone show that made references to previous generations while not solely relying on them. It was successful because it took risks and Lauren Faust wanted to make her own interpretation of the franchise. She didn't want to pander to five-year-old girls. She wanted to make a show that could be watched by any audience of any age. Something that respected people's intelligence. Would the upcoming G5 do any of these things? Well, in the long run, that remains to be seen. But I'm afraid to say that this movie does not make a good first impression. I've seen a lot of people making videos about this movie before it came out, but in spite of that, I wanted to hold my breath on it. I wanted to go into this as blind as possible, trying to keep my expectations realistic. So I made a promise to myself to not say anything about this movie until it actually came out. Unlike those idiots in the brony fandom who got histrionic over every insignificant thing that happened after Lauren Faust left production, or the end of season 2, or Twilight became an alicorn, or the first Equestria Girls movie, or season 4 supposedly flanderized the characters and retconned the first two seasons, or Starlight Glimmer was introduced in season 5, or Flory Hart appeared in season 6, or the Changelings went through their transformation, or season 7 showed an emphasis on lore, or season 8 introduced the student 6, you can probably see why the fandom is mostly dead at this point. 
I want whatever I have to say about this movie to have fair criticisms and critiques, without any stupid whining about personal headcanons or disingenuous remarks. For what it's worth, I always do my best to make sure my reviews are based on cogent arguments and facts, regardless of what dipshits on Twitter would have you believe. I hope you'll at least believe me on that front, as we move forward with this review. The reason why G5 being a sequel to G4 is a problem is because it shows a lack of wanting to take risks. It doesn't want to be its own thing like G4 was. Rather, it's going to rely on the popularity of G4 to get as much attention as possible from bronies. And even then, there's another question that comes to mind. Why exactly are we continuing a story that doesn't need to be continued? The original show ended on a perfect note. Twilight becomes Celestia's successor, the main six fulfill their life goals, Equestria has entered a new era of harmony, and the characters we've grown to love over the course of 10 years are shown to be moving forward with their lives while remaining loyal to their old friendships. I can understand a continuation if it focuses on the same group of characters, where we get to see how their lives have turned out under Twilight's rule. But this series takes place in a huge time skip, way into the future, long after the original characters are dead. While it does focus on a new set of characters, it's still using the same world and setting as a springboard for this story instead of doing something different. Now, relying on the original setting for a sequel isn't necessarily a bad idea on its own, but when you see how the original G5 was intended to be a completely separate thing, it comes across as questionable. People have made the argument that the original concept for G5 would have been a bad idea because it features the redesigns of the main six as the main characters. They say it would have resulted in people making too many comparisons between G4 and 5, resulting in unfair assessments of its quality. And while I do understand what they mean when they say this, there's a problem with this argument. If the brony fandom really is that uptight about G4, then they're gonna make comparisons to G5 no matter what they do with it. And it's not just the brony fandom that does this. People compare different generations of entertainment all the time. It's been that way for decades. Whenever a big name IP gets a new installment of some kind, it'll most likely result in people making comparisons to previous entries. People who compare the classic Pokemon games to the new ones. People who compare the classic Tomb Raider games to the new trilogy. People who compare the original Thundercats cartoon and the original he-Man cartoon to their reboots, the good reboots. People who compare the original Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory to the remake. People who compare the old Animaniacs to the new one. There's hundreds of different examples I can use, so I'll just assume you get the idea. And by choosing to make G5 a direct sequel to G4, they've created a bigger problem for themselves. Now not only are people going to inevitably make comparisons between G4 and 5, but now they have the pressure of being respectful to the continuity and lore of G4. It's not a reboot, a remake, or a spin-off. It's a direct follow-up to the story and world-building established in G4. And because it's a direct follow-up, it's inappropriate to look at this as its own thing. People will say we should try to see this as its own thing to be fair, but it's not that simple when reviewing a sequel. A sequel is not like a reboot or a remake. A sequel is meant to exist alongside the original by nature. When you're watching a sequel, you're watching a story taking place in the same world and setting as the original, regardless of the characters involved. And as a sequel, it has to be faithful to the original. It needs to show respect for the history, mythology, lore, continuity, and legacy of the original characters. Otherwise, it'll be weak at the foundation. It would be like saying the last airbender doesn't matter when talking about the legend of Korra. It doesn't work because it's not something that exists in a separate plane of existence. The story of Korra needs to be respectful to things established by the story of Aang. It has to stay true to the lore and continuity of the previous saga. There needs to be a believable bridge between the gaps of the two shows. Otherwise, it's not a proper sequel. Imagine if someone made a sequel to The Lion King set in the future, and the premise is Scar just magically came back to life and took over the Pride Lands. Just because you say it's a sequel doesn't mean people will accept it. It has to make sense on top of continuing the story faithfully. And this is unfortunately a new generation's biggest failing. Usually when I do a review like this, I save the biggest problems for the end. But this is a very important thing to bring up, so it's best to start by explaining why this doesn't work as a sequel. Here's the setup for the movie. The ponies of Equestria have gone back to hating each other and went their separate ways. And there's your problem! Why the fuck would you do that? It can't be for nothing. <laughs> so, the premise of this movie is that everything just went back to square one. They just pressed the reset button and rendered nine seasons worth of plot development entirely pointless. In the original show, people were separated by hate for each other in the pre-Equestria era. It caused the Windigos to encase their home in ice and force them to find a new home. But after the tribes learned to work together, they drove the Windigos away, and founded a land where Earth ponies, Pegasi, and Unicorns were united, calling it Equestria. It was created on the foundation of this unity, and now it's just gone. 
And wait a minute. Didn't we already do this? Didn't we just have a situation where Earth Ponies, Pegasi, and Unicorns hated each other due to the terrible trio's manipulation? And they were brought together with a big speech about ponies and creatures working together in friendship? Earth Ponies, Unicorns, and Pegasi becoming friends! We learned at Twilight School that friendship is the most powerful magic there is! Focusing on our differences keeps us divided. Villains and creatures like the Wendigos use that division against us. Now all of a sudden we're in a world where everyone went back to hating each other and went to live in exile? Yeah, they basically just did the same thing the Star Wars sequel trilogy did. That peaceful future that Twilight and her friends fought so hard for ended up being total bullshit. And when you think about it, it's all her fault. Don't you think the Princess of Friendship would have a failsafe to make sure nothing bad happened to friendship? What even happened? What caused the ponies to go back to hating each other? There isn't a single line of dialogue to help explain what caused pony kind to separate. They don't even give us a time frame for how long ago this happened. You'd think they would at least say how long it's been because of the ridiculous rumors they make about each other. Apparently Earth Ponies, Pegasi, and Unicorn have been living in separation for so long. Earth Ponies think unicorns actually eat Earth Ponies, or unicorns think Pegasi eat their children. I can understand false speculation, but this is just absurd. What was the point of G4? What was the point of anything that happened if the ponies just went back to hating each other? Twilight failed, her council failed, the School of Friendship failed, the Tree of Harmony was wrong, and what about the Student Six? Remember how big of a deal they were making that speech? The one thing of value they did throughout their entire screen time? Well, I guess everyone just forgot about it and didn't care about the Wendigos coming back. Screw you, Student Six, your contribution means nothing. This just makes so many plot points from the original show a complete waste of time. What was the point of the School of Friendship if no one learned anything from it? Why did we spend an entire season building it up if it just ended up failing? Why was the Tree of Harmony built up if it ends up being forgotten about? Why did they bother building up Twilight's reign if it ended up failing? And did no one do anything to try and prevent this from happening? Celestia and Luna did nothing? Discord did nothing? The multiple Trees of Harmony and their bearers did nothing? Did Spike just fail his duties as an international ambassador? Did anyone try to send a message to Sunset Shimmer about Equestria's collapse? I actually have a whole list of questions raised by this and I really don't have time to go over all of them. So this is a sequel that's going to uproot and retcon everything accomplished in the original because they were too lazy to think of a different conflict. The whole we have to unite the ponies and get them to work together thing has already been done so many times in this show that the well has run dry. It's uncreative and cheap to do this again. And especially when you're starting a new generation that's trying to reel in a new audience. Now I know what some of you might say. Sequels starting over from what the original did happens all the time. It's not something to get riled up about. It doesn't matter how many times it's happened. That doesn't make it good. Do you want to know what we call that? A rehash. This setup is a rehash of the plot from the episode Heartswarming Eve as well as the ending of the end and they don't really do anything to elevate it to new heights. So all you're doing is putting everything on restart for something that isn't unique or interesting. And even if it was doing something unique, it's still bad because resetting the world is an inherent problem with these kinds of sequels. Because it tells the audience that all the time they invested in the original wasn't important. Let me use some examples to explain what I mean. What if Invincible had a sequel where the Viltrumites went back to being blood-hungry tyrants enslaving the galaxy? What if How to Train Your Dragon had a sequel where the humans and dragons went back to fighting? What if Harry Potter had a sequel where Voldemort is still alive attacking muggles and half-breeds because he had some secret horcruxes we didn't know about? What if Lord of the Rings had a sequel where Sauron is still alive and the One Ring wasn't destroyed? What if Mass Effect had a new trilogy where the different races went back into conflict since they no longer have a common enemy to fight against with the Reapers gone? In fact, let me show you an example where this did happen, and a beloved classic was tarnished by its shitty sequel as a result. You remember the Blues Brothers, right? A 1980 movie about two petty criminals who return to their childhood home. An orphanage where a nun tells them they'll be closed down unless they can raise the money to keep it open. So they go on a journey across the country to get their old band back together to raise the money. And at the end of the movie, they succeed, sacrificing their freedom to pay the bill on time and save the orphanage. And then came the sequel, Blues Brothers 2000, where we get this scene. The orphanage is gone, Jake's gone, Curtis is gone. I got no brother, I got no roots, I got no life, I got nothing for Christ's sake. He was very upset when the orphanage closed. So all that time we spent in the first movie trying to save the orphanage, all that hard work and the story of redemption they went through for their old home was completely meaningless. What I'm getting from this scene is that Blues Brothers 2000 just took a giant shit on the original and gave a massive fuck you to everyone who invested their time in this story. 
It completely unmakes the events of the original by rendering the journey, the achievements, and the struggles of the characters completely moot. And a new generation does this to a T. Congratulations, Twilight! You failed to bring everyone together in friendship because G4 just leads to everyone isolating themselves from each other out of hate and racism. Aren't you glad we spent 9 seasons and 10 years of our lives getting invested in your journey to make Equestria a better place while becoming allies with non-pony creatures? This just shows a very strong lack of respect for the saga that came before. The one that put your franchise on the map. The one that made it more mainstream. The one that skyrocketed My Little Pony's popularity and profitability. Not only that, but it actively insults people's intelligence by punishing them for caring about this world. You are taking the investment I had in your story, throwing it in a trash compactor, and laughing at me for having it. This is a fundamentally bad writing decision for a story that had a rich world with engaging characters. We're only four minutes into this movie and it's already broken so many things that were put in place to morph the story in its favor. It's an extremely clunky execution that sacrifices consistency so the writers can change the rules to whatever allows them to tell their new story. And what story did they go with? Well, it focuses on an Earth pony named Sunny Star Scout. She goes on a journey with several other ponies to reunite the three tribes and restore magic, which mysteriously disappeared. Okay, stop, stop. What do you mean magic mysteriously disappeared? Isn't that the thing you rely on for your world to function? Otherwise it'll collapse and fall into chaos? Well, where's the chaos? Why isn't everything destroyed? Why are there no severe consequences for the disappearance of magic? I might be getting ahead of myself here, but this already makes zero sense. The presence of magic in G4 was something that was integral for the world to work. They relied on it for their weather, their food, and to keep the orbit of the sun and moon in check. But none of these things are brought up as an issue throughout the film. They're not even given an explanation. Without magic, how are the Earth Ponies supposed to harvest food? Wasn't it specifically them who were able to provide it for the other ponies? And since Pegasi can't fly, what happened to the weather? Didn't the Pegasi need to keep track of the clouds to make sure the weather was under control? And didn't they use magic to move the sun? Is there an explanation for why the planet hasn't been seared to oblivion? Or did they just find a way to get the sun and moon to move by themselves? Did they invent a machine? Did they cast some sort of spell? Were Celestia and Luna ousted as frauds since it was revealed they were never needed to move them? Wasn't it their destiny to be the alicorns of day and night? The very thing personified by their cutie marks? Their destiny just stopped mattering because they just found a way to get the sun and moon to move? And if the ponies of Equestria went back to hating each other, where are the Windigos? Shouldn't they be coming back to case Equestria on snow and ice? Did they just cancel heartswarming because the holiday doesn't mean anything anymore? We don't know. None of this is ever explained. There isn't a single line of dialogue that hints at anything that could explain how their society is still functioning without magic. We don't know how long it's been gone, or even if it was ever important, and they don't do anything to convey why magic should return. In spite of it supposedly being vital for this world to work, to the point where the Season 8 finale explained how Equestria would collapse without it, everything about Equestria seems fine. There's no food shortage, no bad weather, no disease plaguing the land, and obviously they found a way to get the sun and moon to move by themselves. Why do we need to bring back magic? Equestria seems to be doing pretty well without it. There's no urgency in the situation, so you're not all that invested in Sunny's mission to restore magic. But they do take the time to explain why magic disappeared. Apparently there was this Triforce of Power that was linked to all the magic inside the ponies in Equestria. But then someone stole it or it was just split into three pieces resulting in the ponies losing their power. So the actual plot is traveling across Equestria in search for a MacGuffin they need to restore magic. I was saving this criticism for the Season 10 comics, but it makes as much sense to use it here. Where did this crystal come from? Why are we only learning about it now? This is supposed to be a very important item, but it's making its first appearance 12 years after the fact. This is where we're faced with the issue of trying to fit things into the story way after the first season, in a tell-don't-show kind of way. This is something that happens when the writer introduces an element to the story that we're constantly being told is very important. But if it's so important, why did it take this long to be introduced? Why are you trying to make this look like something that was there from the start when there was no signs it was there? This is something you clearly just made up for the conflict to work. And it's not just magical items that contribute to this. It can also happen with the presence of certain characters. Someone who was secretly there from the beginning even though they weren't. For example, Devora from MK10 who never had any foreshadowing or hints to her presence in the lore. But now all of a sudden she's this very important character who was totally there from the very beginning. Regardless of whether it's a character or a magical item, this writing trope tries to add a significant amount of importance to a plot device that wasn't turned. And that's what this pony Triforce is. A plot device. It exists just to fuel the story. 
The Elements of Harmony was a plot device and oftentimes it was cheaply used by the writers, but its existence in the world was believable because it was established early on, and its presence was given a simple explanation. They're a set of magic jewels that Celestia used to protect Equestria from dark threats, and they were used to help reform Luna. Now you've thrown in this all-powerful crystal that has a special link to all ponies, and it must be kept safe otherwise everyone loses their magic. It's an out-of-left-field addition to the lore, and its presence raises a lot of questions. If this crystal is so important to preserving the magic of ponies, you'd think it might have been brought up before. Why didn't Tyrek try stealing it? Why didn't the Storm King try stealing it? I would imagine they would see value in it if it's linked to all the magic in Equestria. Why wasn't it heavily guarded? Nobody thought to have guards stationed to keep it from being stolen or separated? Someone just waltzed in and took it? Why did Sonny's father have one of the pieces? Why didn't he tell Sonny about the crystal? Did he know? Did he not know? We're never given an explanation for where this Triforce came from. At this point you might have noticed the biggest reason why this doesn't work as a sequel. There's no context to anything going on. The movie introduces a whole bunch of stuff without taking any time to tell us how we got here, what caused it, where these things came from, or why we're suddenly back to where we started. It makes the story less immersive because nothing was properly established. It's lazy and contradictive. But what about the other stuff in the movie? We still have to talk about the plot development, characters, and new world. Let's start with the new world. It's honestly kind of bland. And no, it's not because of the new technology. On some level I can see the technology evolving since G4, so it makes sense they would have some electronic stuff. The problem comes from how it's mostly unimpressive. The movie shows almost nothing that couldn't already be found in the show. We already had wacky machines, big looking cities, factories, and enchanted looking landscapes. The only brand new thing they introduce is live streaming and cell phones. Maybe it would be interesting if it was important, but none of this new technology has any influence on the story, and it doesn't really do enough to elevate the world from what we saw on G4. The closest I can think of is during the Cantor Logic presentation, where they try to use the over-the-top inventions to show the hysteria of Earth ponies, but it doesn't really amount to anything except some slapstick that doesn't move anything forward. They really could have done something more impressive. Something like fortified villages or new weapons to keep outsiders from getting in. There's almost nothing new here, to the point where it feels like nothing has actually changed. Why is this set in a huge time skip if there's nothing new? The world looks the same as it did in ancient times, so there really isn't that much world building going on. As for the plot development, it's passable. Of all the elements of the movie, the pacing is actually the best one. It doesn't feel overwhelming or sluggish, and they at least take the time to develop character relationships. I thought the pacing was going to be really fast given the high energy in the trailers, but it was pretty relaxed all things considered. There's also the comedy, which is, okay I suppose. I don't want to say it's bad, but it could have been stronger. There's a proper sense of timing with an understanding of the characters delivering the lines, but some of it feels very predictable or doesn't have a strong enough punchline. I can see why other people would find these jokes funny, especially the more visually fueled ones, but it's just not my cup of tea. As for the characters, there really isn't that much to talk about, particularly because they're mostly bland and uninteresting. Sonny's father is the usual supportive parent who dies off screen after the prologue, nothing more or less. Izzy Moonbow is a Pinkie Pie clone. Yeah, there's no question, it's basically Pinkie Pie. I mean, she's bubbly and entertaining, but you just keep being reminded that she's a clone of Pinky. To be fair though, she's a better clone character than Zip Storm and Pip Petals. Zip is just Rainbow Dash except she doesn't do anything to leave an impression. And Pip is just rarity, except the obsession with fashion is replaced with cell phones and live streaming. As for Sunny, she's a diet Twilight Sparkle, spending her screen time trying to get people to believe in the magic of friendship. She's not bad, but not particularly interesting. The main issue with these characters is that none of them are unique or stand on their own. They just amount to watered-down versions of the old gang. If you really wanted to recycle the main six, why didn't you just go with the original concept you had? All of these characters feel very underdeveloped, which isn't good since they're supposed to be the main leads. None of them really stand out, and their personalities aren't especially well-defined. The Pegasus Queen Haven is pretty funny, but she doesn't really do much and gets thrown into the background really fast. Even the role of the villain feels underwhelming. He starts off as this bumbling idiot who works for Hitch and then randomly turns into a maniacal dictator. It's a really weird decision to turn this harmless, non-threatening fool into the central antagonist. The film briefly makes you believe his mother is the real villain, whispering corrupt things into his ear to make him do bad things. But she just ends up scolding him for going nuts, making the whole villain arc confusing and almost entirely pointless. It's a classic example of a film that didn't need a villain, but decided to insert one anyway because they don't know how to create tension otherwise. The only character in this movie that's memorable in any way is Sheriff Hitch Trailblazer. Admittedly, a lot of it comes from the voice work 
of Tom Wachowski, who you might remember as the sheriff from the Sonic movie. Interesting coincidence? He's very energetic without being over the top, and his delivery has an enthusiastic pitch, making a lot of his lines more humorous. Unlike the other main characters, he's also the most unique. He's more of an original character instead of a copy of a previous one. If anything, he's the one who kept me watching to the end. If it wasn't for him, I most likely would have lost interest and stopped watching entirely. Especially since the plot is more or less a generic mix of the series Premiere, Heartswarming Eve, and Magical Mystery Cure. Why do I say Magical Mystery Cure? Well, because it ends with Sunny turning into an alicorn. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of people are gonna be annoyed by this. But in all fairness, this isn't entirely the movie's fault. This was a problem in the original show, too, as they never really did anything to convey the significance of Alicorns. Celestia and Luna are introduced as celestial beings with unmatched power, but Chrysalis manages to overpower Celestia because the love she absorbed from Shining Armor made her stronger, I guess. But then Caden shares her love with Shining Armor, and that somehow makes her more powerful than Chrysalis. It's said that Celestia and Luna are special because of their status as Alicorns, but Cadence and Floriheart are introduced as Alicorns without an explanation. It would have been one thing if we got an origin story for the princesses, but as far as we know, that never happened. So now it just comes across as Alicorn's not being special, and it's a gimmick whenever someone turns into one. At least with Twilight, she had three seasons worth of development before her transformation. Sunny is only developed for about an hour, which begs the question, how significant does completing a task have to be to become an Alicorn? Was restoring the Triforce really supposed to be enough? Was it her strong faith in friendship? There's no real straightforward answer for what made her one. The main problem with the plot itself is that it doesn't do anything surprising or unexpected with its premise. For a movie about bringing people together and stopping racism, the film does next to nothing to tackle the issue, spending most of its time on making jokes and going on this forced MacGuffin hunt. The villain is played for a joke instead of being used as a critique on the bigotry and xenophobia splitting the races apart, and the rest of the story is far too predictable for its own good. It doesn't tug at the heartstrings anywhere near as much as it could've, especially since it starts with killing Sonny's dad off-screen. A red herring makes you think they need to reassemble the gemstones, but all they really had to do was believe in friendship to save the day. You know, something they already did dozens of times in the original show. Totally didn't see that coming. And then the movie doesn't really end. It just suddenly stops. Like they succeeded in restoring magic while uniting the ponies and go, cool I guess, and then it just cuts to the credits. It abruptly ends with no real sense of closure. What happened to Equestria after magic was restored? And there's still a number of questions that they never answered. What happened to Discord? Where are Celestia and Luna? You'd think with their long lifespans they would still be alive, yet they took no action when the ponies separated. What happened to the other creatures? The changelings? Dragons? Yaks? Hippogriffs? Griffins? Zebras? Diamond Dogs? Obsidians? The Avians? None of them are even mentioned. What happened to everyone? One argument people will make for this is that these questions will be answered when the series comes out. So I have to wait several months for the series for these dozens of questions to get an answer? That's not satisfying. The elephant in the room is too big to simply ignore. It makes the story and the world feel incomplete because the number of questions raised by the writing decisions they went with is so overwhelming. This movie has so much unresolved leverage as a result of retconning G4, and they don't take the time to slowly ease themselves into the end credits. They just say, mission accomplished, goodbye. Imagine if Return of the King cut to credits with Frodo and Sam at the top of the volcano, or if Endgame cut to credits after Tony passed away. You can't just cut to credits after defeating the bad guy or resolving the conflict. You need to show resolution for the characters and give them a proper conclusion. Otherwise, you're just abruptly ending the movie instead of giving us a proper conclusion. I wouldn't mind too much except for a number of things unresolved, even by the standards of this film. What happened to Sprout? Did he just get off scot-free after becoming a fascist dictator? What happened to the Royal Pegasus family? Are they still hated by the citizens, or were they forgiven for restoring their flight? Did the unicorn stop being superstitious? It's unfulfilling and lazy. There are some good qualities to the film, so there's at least some form of entertainment value. The songs are good, they have good vocal performances and rhythm with a consistent pattern to them, and the animation is fantastic. The art direction of the environments and characters is very detailed, and the models transition to 3D surprisingly well. The voice acting is pretty solid, though it makes me wonder how they'll be able to keep these celebrities around since they wouldn't have a higher budget for a TV series. So how does this fare as a whole? Well, it ends up suffering from several things, and the plot they go for is automatically tainted by the previous saga. If this was something on its own, it could have worked with some refining. The story is predictable and generic, but not obnoxiously childish. The characters are inoffensive, but mostly boring with some exceptions. And thankfully, there's no forced identity politics or representation like some people said it would have. If this was a standalone film, it could be better with more care. 
but it's still a sequel to Friendship is Magic. And as a sequel to Friendship is Magic, it fails. And it fails hard. The concept uproots far too many things from the original show. Dozens upon dozens of retcons. So many questions they don't bother to answer. All sorts of unfortunate implications. And it's incredibly insensitive to the struggles of the original characters and all the people who got invested in their journey. Seeing them grow, seeing them build a better life for themselves, seeing them establish a new era of peace. All of it thrown into the garbage bin for the sake of pushing a new generation. I still stand by that the original concept they had for G5 would have been much more interesting and unique. It could have been something different, something refreshing, something that could have acted as a proper successor to G4. Instead, we got a mediocre road trip movie that does very little to live up to the legacy of its predecessor. It could have been worse, but it could have, and should have, been a lot better. Thanks for checking out my review. If you liked what you saw here and would like to support me, feel free to check out my Patreon in the description. Every little bit helps and I always appreciate those who support my work. Until next time, stay cool.